Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Better Body Radio. Quick disclaimer before we get started today. Today's episode is purely for information and educational purposes only. It is not intended to treat or diagnose any form of medical condition. Please do consult with a healthcare practitioner if this is the case. Now, I want to bring your attention to two of the services that we offer here at Better Body Collective. The first being our one-to-one coaching service. We provide in-person and online versions of this in person to those based in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, and online for everywhere else in the world, and of course here for the UE as well. If you're someone who is looking for personalized, like I mean purely individualized one-to-one coaching for improving your body composition with a very much health first and evidence-based approach then look no further that's exactly what we offer you can go ahead and click the link in our bio and apply for coaching button in order to start get started with your coaching application from there we'll then move to an initial meeting in person or over zoom and we'll discuss your goals we'll discuss what the journey is going to involve and what you can expect from your journey as it unfolds The second service I'd like to bring your attention to is in fact our educational offering, the first educational offering from our company at the moment is the Muscle Mechanics Mentorship. This is purely targeted at coaches based here in the UAE. It's an eight week blended learning course where we have eight weeks of online learning to go through as as well as two practical weekends, one at the halfway mark at the end of week four and one at the end of week eight. For me, I wish this was a course that I had when I started out as a coach. There is nothing more important than what we do as in-person coaches than than exercise mechanics and understanding the implications of the forces that we're putting through our clients' bodies. And not only that, but how we can modify exercise to suit the individual and how we can get the absolute best possible body composition results from them as as a byproduct of knowing this information and how to apply it. So if you're a coach and you're based here in the UAE and you're interested in knowing more about how you can level up your coaching, your results, and your income, really, then please do click the link in the bio and tap the black button that says muscle mechanics intake. So to no further ado, let's move into the episode. Charlie, how are you doing? Very good, mate. All good. Awesome. Awesome. How's how's the week been so far? So far, so good. Training's going well. Diet's going well. Just have to keep, it's just in that middling phase where nothing's moving nothing's looking exceptionally phenomenal but you know you're just making like slow progress week on week so it's the it's the head to the, uh, the nose to the grindstone phase right now i suppose exactly it's a good way to describe it i think uh, for anyone who's listening they probably don't know like so for example there's myself mal charlie and the better body team but we're actually all in contest prep at the moment or in prep of some kind obviously we have a more determined date for ours you're kind of a little bit in the in limbo at the moment as to what you might actually compete in right yeah, I'm still waiting for, so I'll have to compete in Germany, which was the, com- the competition I competed in 2019. Um, so they're still just waiting for a date. They have a rough idea. I know it will be in November, uh, sorry, October, but I don't know a, a date just yet. So I have a rough idea. It's exciting times because we'll, be, uh, we'll be hitting our, I'll be hitting my debut miles, obviously competing before, I'll be doing that in September and then literally a month later. Charlie's back on the stage. So we're all going to be uh, in pretty good net come September time. And then, the dream is we go on a company trip to Las Vegas to Worlds if we if we all qualify. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's that's the plan. That's the plan anyway. Definitely. So uh, just to intro a bit about this kind of next series of podcasts. So I had been running these a little bit solo for a while, and then way back at the start, I had Mark Doherty come on as a bit of a guest speaker. But now that we've kind of solidified our team a little bit and we're we're in a position where we're like, right, we want to start getting more regular podcasts back out, but we want to have. You know, the guest episodes are nice. They're nice to have the guests on talking about their speciality and kind of going in in only a way that they know how to. But we also got to remember as well that we have a lot of gem popping coaches that listen to this. And I think it's probably quite nice to dive into some of the general topics that we're kind of dealing with on a day-to-day basis with our clients. So I guess this is why now I decided it'd be a good idea to get Charlie on one week and maybe get Mal on another week. And we'll record a couple of episodes that think we do that. And the goal is going to be to, to put out as much value in these little small, short podcasts as possible. So, uh, Charlie, are you ready for episode number one? Yeah, let's fire, let's bang it out. Let's see what we can help some people. So, uh, the topic I decided we we're going to run with first, um, and it's a little bit of an interesting one because, listen, everyone knows that we specialize in body composition, and we are obviously massive on what can we do to optimize that process. Part of that process often is very much tracking calories and macros. However, there are definitely situations not just for based on level or ability or experience, but also just time dependent and also process dependent where 
tracking calories and macros might not either be such a good idea or there's other ways that we can go about getting away, which is ultimately then goal for maintenance is to get away from tracking calories and macros and be able to eat actually intuitively and not the intuitive eating that seems to be popularly, uh, popularly parroted on social media all the time, which is, oh, you know, I'm just feeling like that whole bucket of Ben and Jerry's something to have. It's like, no, that's not quite what we mean, but but yeah, it's been able to eat in a way that's very much in line with your values and in line with good quality habits uh, that allows you to achieve a level of life balance that you may not otherwise get when you're going through a focused phase of training. So um, starting off the top, Charlie, can you lead us off? Like, if you were looking at, let's just start with the methods and then we'll maybe get into the time frames. What would be probably the, the biggest non-tracking method or context that you would probably look at for client, clients that you work with? In terms of context, it's a little bit variable because there can be uh, the the super beginner client mm. where, and I've, I've had a few of these where that going straight to tracking at least calories and macros is just such a big step or perhaps even, even if it's actually not, it's perceived to be a big hassle and they don't want to do that just yet or feel they can't do that just yet. Mm. So typically bringing in any kind of non-tracking methods for people like that is going to be step number one mm -hmm. and then you've got the other side of the spectrum people who've been tracking forever um and are getting maybe a bit bit long in the tooth of it are getting a bit sick of it and are maybe moving away from a fat loss very focused fat loss phase and then why not take that chance to decompress a little bit and find out exactly where they stand in terms of what they've learned from tracking macros, how their um, perceived kind of hunger and, and intuition around food is. And um, people like that can really benefit from moving away from tracking a little bit. Definitely. I think, um, like you were saying about the people on the, almost the other end of the spectrum who are very experienced, very used to tracking, maybe there are people who have done photo shoots, a physique transformation or two, other competitors. Uh, I think where this kind of then starts to move towards as well is relationship with food is massively important. I think often the general public who are maybe not quite at the body composition goal yet would maybe think that those people who have reached that point, they've got it all figured out as far as their mental game goes. But we, you and I both know that food, dis uh, you know, food disorders and disorder eating are rife in the fitness industry, not just with the gym talk they work with, or maybe even really fit individuals, but also coaches, trainers, competitors as well. And so I think, like you said, like if, one of the things we often talk about is this idea of food focus. Food focus is, you know, you're not going to be able to avoid it. It's going to be massively high during the dieting phase. And so I think one of the massive benefits, like you said, of for those people coming out of a diet into non-tracking methods is it's trying to remove some of that food focus. And it's not necessarily wrong at times to have a food focus, but it's when you end up developing a neurotic food focus, you start to meander down a pretty dangerous path as far as binge eating disorder or just disorder eating behavior. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, it's important for either end of the spectrum and for many different levels or, or goals as well. Yep. And then in terms of how we, how we implement that, I'm a little bit more practiced with the, the beginner side of things, certainly. And it really is more about, I suppose, what we call like process or action goals. So just mm -hmm. having tasks that they have to do have to do or should do daily um, to just make sure that we're monitoring their nutrition in some way. So for the, the rank beginner, it might be something like um, just getting some kind of meal routine in place. Are you having three square meals a day? Um, and then built into that will be, does each one of those meals have a protein source? Does each one of those meals have a, a, a vegetable, fibrous vegetable? Like it might be that simple. Um, just to start getting to just think about what they're putting on their plate and what they're putting in them in their mouth um and and for a few weeks that can that might take that might take a whole month to to bed down mm -hmm. but it's a nice start point it tend, tends to build a quite solid foundation definitely i think it's, it's probably one of the main reasons why and you know this is a big change we've made to our online check and tracking sheets recently is we've moved the process goals right up near the top whereas they used to sit down the bottom because i think we we all agree that you know the reality is yes you can even follow your calories and macros but we've often found that there's a bit of a disparity between that and the daily process and action goals it's still not going to be quite where it is and ultimately those underpin the quality and the outcome success of hitting those calories and macros as well um so yeah like and then like you said for some clients 
calories might even be completely off the table. And I know we've even looked at some other people, it might just be right, only hit your calories and don't worry about anything else. Then it might be right, we're going to layer this, start layering this on top. We're going to then add in protein, a protein goal. Even then, though, it might not be a, a gram amount and it might not even be, a, it might be a, like, I just want you to have a portion of protein at every meal, just an approximate portion. Then we can start adding the number to that. I might want you to get this much protein across the day. Then I want you to now be able to get this much protein per meal. And so like you say, there's like maybe just that's one process and action goal, but there's so many steps and layers to add on top of that before we're even getting to, you know, the whole big picture, which is tracking every single gram and of food that you're putting in your mouth. So yeah, uh, and then like you said as well, outside of the food side of things then, well, what about all the stuff that actually creates an environment for that's, that's going to actually get the most from the food that we put into it, from the training stimulus that we put, we put on ourselves as well. So, hey, how's your sleep going? Maybe that's an area we just, let's dial in on that because we know that that's going to have a cascade effect to many other things like energy, like digestion, like uh, satiety and hunger and all that sort of stuff. So, so yeah, I, could, I couldn't agree more. I think for most people, anyone who's big on habit psychology, most people have read uh, either Atomic Habits by James Clear or there was The Power of Habit, which was from a guy that was like the original. Um, Charles Duhigg. Habit yeah. Charles Duhigg, exactly. Not a lot of people know that book because I think James Clear's kind of became He's so kind of popular in that space, but uh, Charles Duhigg was the original guy. He was the original guy with the hamster on the wheel and the white book. Always yeah, that. I think I've got it on my bedside table there, actually. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, couldn't agree more. I think habits really is the foundation for any level of goal uh, when it comes to what we do with anyone. Yeah, and, and the good thing I've found in practice about doing that is it it almost leads them down the garden path. Like they'll, mm. you know, if you say, I want you to eat three square meals and some protein with every meal, you know, they'll either ask for your help or, or sometimes just do it intuitively and like, okay, well, you know, how, how much should that look like? And you can help them out with that. Mm. And so they end up kind of layering in their own sort of ways of making that somewhat quantified. So which is quite useful, really. Yeah, it's like a voyage of self-discovery, isn't it? It's like, you're just like, I'm just going to give you a little bit and you can kind of then go, go with that and see how far you want to take that in terms of exploration. And then for some people, they might just go, oh, like, I know that for a lot of people, implementing more veggies into the diet, it seems, we know why that's such a good idea, but it just might be really, really hard. And it's like, you know what, let's park that for the moment. Let's maybe focus on on something else and that kind of just gave me a really good um, thought process as well one of the the other benefits of looking at habit-based goals as well and what that can almost indirectly do to energy balance because even though we say that we're not going to use we're going to use non-tracking methods it doesn't mean that calories are not in play they're always in play whether we track them or not right so even for example looking at right we're just going to get some more veggies with your meals just going to have a portion of veggies, like uh, put a, a bag of green green giant mixed veg on the steamer. Just have that, just get a cup and put that on your plate and just do that. And it's amazing just by increasing nutrient density, fiber intake. And then like, oh, I'm eating, and you, you've had this before, we've had this with numerous new clients recently. I'm eating more food than I ever have, but I'm losing weight. Why is that? Maybe you want to tell the guys exactly why that is. That That is just because they've, they've been eating very little food volume but a very high calorie, typically very highly calorie dense amount of food. So, you know, something that's a really easy example is like a Big Mac, I suppose, probably weighs like 300 grams, um, maybe less actually. So you're getting about 600, 700 calories from 300 grams worth of food where you could, you could have, you could easily have 200 grams of vegetables plus 150 grams of protein, plus a, a nice serving of carbs and get like a, kilo a half per kilo to 600 grams of food for half those calories and that's basically what we're doing without going into like that much detail with people it's just getting them to actually eat firstly foods that are not so calorie dense but are very voluminous but then also more nutrient dense so they will typically feel fuller and be more properly fueled for what they're what they're doing in their life so they've got more energy feel fuller and then obviously because the calories are balanced out they, the, the scale moves appropriately exactly so i always like to i think this is always there and, and i feel like i need to update an infographic on this i put one out ages ago on this the whole nutrient density versus energy density continuum uh, and the way i always kind of try to explain to clients is like imagine you've got on this end all your single ingredient foods like literally just the single ingredient veggies fruits like lean proteins all that sort of stuff and then on the way on the other end you've got like 
actually granulated, like, you know, literally like you've got granulated white flour, sugar, stuff that's very, very minimal in nutrition value, but it's very energy dense and energy compact. And then there's all the stuff that's in between, because then, for example, you can have stuff that's both energy and calorie dense. So obviously that blends towards things like fat sources, so like fatty meats, yeah. oils, nuts, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, dark chocolate's another really good one. It's actually got quite good amount of nutrition in it, like high, high percentage cocoa dark chocolate. It's actually got quite a lot of nutrition in it, but it's also very calorie yeah. dense for the size of it. Exactly. So, so there's that end, there's that continuum with everything in between. And I think when clients can kind of get their head around that, it's like, oh, and it's like, right, that then takes us into another topic. There's no good or bad foods. It's then the case that there's this continuum that exists. And depending on where you are on your journey, you might have to prioritize a bit more towards this end and a lot less from that end. But when calories are high, when you're lucky that you've achieved a knockout transformation, you're trying to put on a bit of muscle afterwards, you can start stealing a bit more foods from that end of the continuum because you've got more energy in play. And so I think that can be such an empowering part of that process as well. Yeah, I think that's all, it's all part of that kind of ongoing education pro of that happens with good coaching is like you not not really even telling them what to do but just giving them these kind of insights and tools and stuff they can take away and it's practical um which tends to just again they'll they'll self-correct for that kind of thing like once people kind of understand that that it's much easier for, for them to whether they're looking on the shelf at the supermarket or at a restaurant menu to figure out like oh this is coming from this end of the the spectrum or the other and they can just self-correct and make those decisions on the fly which again is all part of that non-tracking is that if they do which is probably going to happen like once they're out of their fat loss phase they'll want to go out for the weekend with the family or they've got a work dinner or something they're going to want you know they're not going to be bringing their scale to to the do meal with them so having that tool in the toolbox to say you know i'm looking at uh uh because I can't think of anything else chicken like something like chicken fried chicken and waffles like yes. okay probably a lot of stuff going on in there or you've got like a decent steak with a bunch of different side options that you can choose from like from french fries down to a side salad with maybe a baked potato in the middle and like you can start they can start freestyling much easier when they understand about how they can pick out these kind of qualities of a food yeah, for sure. It's kind of that example you gave this perfect because it could be right when I'm at one stage of a diet, I'm choosing this and this side, but when I'm at a point where calories are higher, then I can have that. Or if I just really want that, I know how to adjust the other parts of the week or day in order to accommodate that choice as well, which, like you say, then means that versus the, oh, well, I've, I've done that now, so fuck it, I'm just going to sabotage the rest of my week. You then can go, no, no, I can course correct this, it's not a problem at all. Yeah. That leads me on really nicely. So I want us to finish this particular topic on, um, we'll, we'll kind of take a stab at this each. Like you're kind of one to three, probably the things you would say like non-tracking related habits or methods that you, you feel that tend to be the most effective, the most profound in terms of producing client results. Uh, I think that my number one is uh, probably overlooked by a lot of people, but just taking 15 to 20 minutes at each meal. Mm. Like sounds boring and for a lot of the wide and tired and the execs, it's, it's a tough one to implement, but it, it helps massively. And people find, oh, you know, I'm not finishing my meal or whatever. And it's like, the yeah, you're actually full now. Um, so the, the biggest thing with the people who uh, don't want to track, haven't tracked is, is always, a, uh, not always, it comes down to sometimes a time issue. Um, and they find, yeah, you're having these really high calorie dense meals and you're also shoveling them in between meetings or while looking at the emails and stuff like that and it's just to, just to slow that down you know get your satiety signals in check while you eat and uh just generally enjoy the meal a bit more uh very underrated so I, i'd pick pick out that one as a one already said this one as well just just getting some some kind of structure to your day uh, another big and I'm, again, I'm coming at this from the beginner side of things. So maybe you can go for the people who are coming out of a, a tracking phase. But these kind of people are just all over the place. It's no breakfast one day. It's it's a delivery lunch one day, a uh, 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 work lunch and the next day where they're having a few beers with it. And it's just, they, there's never any structure or rarely any structure to their days. And just getting them, like I say, it doesn't have to be three square meals. It could be four, it could be two, um, whatever but getting some regularity to their 
their nutrition on a daily basis will help them again massively just course correct and get their hunger signals straight um because again it's those guys and girls who are skipping breakfast and maybe even skipping lunch because they're just so busy at work again that'll be the people who say i barely eat. i only have dinner every day but dinner is a is a feast because they're by the time they get to that end of the day they're starving um and so again some kind of delivery app is going to be coming out uh, poor choices are probably going to be made whereas having those slightly more regular feedings nothing to do with the uh, stoking the metabolism or whatever but it's just getting the hunger signals just straightened out and they could typically if, you've, if anyone's ever been to the supermarket when you're hungry you have the, the worst shopping cart you've ever come out with you're like why did i buy all this garbage but if you go to the supermarket slightly fed you'd usually make good decisions it's, it's the same thing throughout your day i find um and then the third is just trying to get some uh, grasp on protein and vegetables. If, if people can get that in it, uh, every time they sit down to eat a square meal, something's going to be right for the most part. Yeah. Those would be my top three, I think. Very nice. So um, just to, to clarify for point one, when um, Charlie said wired and tired, he didn't say wired and tired because that probably oh, yeah, for a lot of people. So. <laughs> what, yeah, accent. wired and tired. With the accent, I thought that's going to sound like wired on the podcast and people are going to go, what are you no, no. tired? What are you trying to say? <laughs> wired and tired is what he said. <laughs> um, I'll probably just piggyback on the first one as well. Like you were saying about the taking the time to actually sit and eat. Um, I think that this is kind of tied into that a little bit as well because let's be honest, you're not going to be eating for 15 to 20 minutes if you're taking two bites and then swallowing. So it actually just actually taking about you know almost close to 20 bites or as i like to say make sure that your food is like paste like consistency before you swallow it or very close to that so that's obviously going to differ depending on the food consistency some foods you're going to take a lot less to break down other foods it's going to take a lot more so i eat your proteins you're going to be you should you best be sitting during that thing until it's really really masticated down so yeah. um, not only does that actually get the digestive processes do they actually start in your mouth you put your sandalies and all that sort of stuff so you're taking your time to do that is important, but actually the mechanical chewing process actually helps to upregulate that satiety process from the start as well. So it's important to actually, right, not only to do it just to make sure that your food is actually digestible by the time it reaches the duodenum and it starts actually going through that kind of process of actually right, I'm going to extract nutrients and all that sort of stuff and the whole bile and stomach acid thing. But it actually starts that signaling process in the brain, which is just as important for fat loss. So yeah, when you've got a meal, even though you're dieting, take your damn time, chew your foods, take it, take it really, really slowly because it's huge for a number of reasons. Um, I think the, the, the other thing as well is probably like, for me, if I were to go away from the other two ones that you did, because I think those were ideal, and I, I would have probably said those two as well, is for me, sleep. It's an area that we probably are constantly having a battle with clients all the time. And it's probably the one that I would say of all the things, all the habits that are there, it's the one that people find the hardest to change. People are so stuck on a certain routine before bed, um, you know, and that could be like, well, I've been working all day and I've trained and I've got in bed. I just want to sit and vegetate and watch Netflix for two hours. Uh, and I'm not saying you necessarily need to stop watching Netflix, but there's a lot of knock-on effects that unfortunately happen from, you know, staying up late, watching a lot of screens. And so you can imagine that the few things I'm going to tick off here, there's the staying up later than you need to. There's the, the blue light exposure in there as well. There's an opportunity there to potentially become a bit for do mindfulness practices so like breathing, meditation, mobility. So you start to get the ideas that it's not that you're necessarily completely replacing that habit. It's like, well, what is that currently doing to my actual pre-bed routine? Could I be fostering a pre-bed routine that is a little bit more closer to ideal? So maybe it's like, right, I'm going to give myself a one episode limit on my current episode on Netflix. Once that goes off, all the lights go off. That's maybe a time to just start relaxing. Why not? If you've got a partner, it might be time that you actually engage with each other and you're not just sitting beside each other watching TV and you're not actually engaging with each other. Um, so it's stuff, stuff for times like that. Um, I think that's a massive one. And get, giving people back a bit of their connectivity with either if they're living alone, time to connect with themselves, or if they're living with partners, a bit of both connecting themselves and actually connecting with their partner uh, can be huge. Uh, and great for some people's um, sex lives as well, which is um, cannot be overlooked. It's part of the whole health game as well. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll quickly just uh, add to that as well. That's also a time I hear all the time as well. Oh, I really get my cravings at like 11, whatever at night. I'm like, you should probably just be asleep. <laughs> like you're, you're, one way to stop those cravings is just like sort your sleep out and you'll, you won't be hitting that kind of 
it's normally always out of boredom as well. If, like you say, they're four episodes deep into a Netflix thing and they're just kind of just a bit bored. It's a boredom meeting almost trigger. Um, so yeah, just just getting on top of that sleep eliminates a lot of those problems too. Hundred percent, and I think as well, like for a lot of clients, when they do start training regularly and start eating better, they actually don't want to stay up that late as well because they start feeling tired. And they just want to go to bed. But like you said, previous habits would be inactive maybe having eight for six, seven, eight hours. Um, and, and that's a big problem. To touch on that point about eating, yeah, having a structure, I can say to a lot of my clients, listen, like there's a not, met, not stoking the whole metabolic fire nonsense that was around for years and everything else and boosting your metabolism. It was more to do with, once you start kind of getting a bit of an idea of appreciating how important managing blood sugar is, if for any reason, other than just having sustained energy levels and keeping your satiety and hunger in a good place, if you're just eating at regular intervals, if, the, if it's for anything, it would be for that. Just keep your blood sugar. Once blood sugar starts to tank, there's a whole cascade of issues that come with that. So like you said, a lot of people are very likely to start snacking, let Netflix and snack versus Netflix and chill. That's what it should be called because mostly people Netflix and snack. Uh, they wouldn't feel the need to do that so much if they actually met their nutritional needs throughout the day up to that point. Uh, and the last one for me is actually hydration. Um, and that's twofold. So I would say that one, people obviously don't drink enough water, but often what I say to people, and I know some people that literally drink like fishes, but like, but I still just don't feel hydrated. So it's a bit of a double barrel answer. It's first of all, well, let's look at your food intake. Is that sufficient? Yes or no. If not, let's address it first and then we'll look at that. For some people, if fluid intake is sufficient, but like I'm still just feeling really dehydrated, then the chances are you've got a bit of an electrolyte issue there. So there's technically speaking quite a few electrolytes. The two main ones we tend to focus on are sodium and potassium. But technically speaking, there's also uh, magnesium and calcium as well that actually come into that mix of four as well. Um, most people are kind of getting magnesium because they supplement a lot of people. Uh, but where actually people are massively lacking is the, um, and especially actually funny when they switch to a more nutrient dense diet, because especially the older generation, I don't know if your parents were told this, mine certainly were, oh no, don't add salt to your food and that's bad for you. Uh, the problem with that is, though, is like, see, see if you get low, low blood pressure, for example, I can almost guarantee if you can increase your electrolyte balance up to a sustainable place, your blood pressure will come to a decent place, most likely, along with exercise and everything else. Because often what people are doing is they're trying to eat well, but they're not getting enough sodium and potassium. Uh, and there's a bit of another layer to that. I won't go into it now, but there's the whole, like, actually getting your sodium and potassium to a one-to-one -one ratio. But a lot of people are hugely lacking in potassium, but massively, potentially, either overshooting sodium or they're actually not getting enough of either so i found that like from a habits perspective even just getting people to buy like the two different types of salts you've got like your molding salt like your sea salt you've got like your himalayan rock salt this is very sodium rich whereas like your good old-fashioned from the uk the good old low salt good old table salt is your like your iodized salt and that's actually very potassium rich and sodium low hence the low name so just actually getting used to using, like, okay, for your first couple of meals off your first meal, I just want you to sprinkle a good amount of that over, like, the, the, the mold and salt, for example. Yeah. On your last meal of the day, I want you to do a nice, health, healthy uh, sprinkle of the low salt. Just something like that can make such a huge difference because they're obviously coming from a diet which is very processed food and potentially sodium-rich to an hour diet that actually is, is, it's got some of that, but it's not anywhere near as much. Um, so that's kind of things to look at as well. We could go into the whole what foods are potassium and sodium rich. That's probably a podcast in of itself. But yeah, for me, it's just hydration. Uh, and that's obviously, like I mentioned, it's got levels to it. It could either be simple and just drinking more water. It can also go all the way to right as your electrolytes in a good place. I find when people get their hydration in a good spot, we know what and how much of an impact hydration has on so many functions. So if you can get your, point, your body to a point where it feels hydrated, that has such a massive win on things like focus, energy, recovery, all that stuff. Um, you know, even digestion as well. Yep, I think that's uh, that's quite a good one actually, and often often overlooked. And then of course you've got the other problem, more more so here in Dubai, of the difference between like drinking water and mineral water and stuff like that. And people mm. will be kind of you know a lot of people are drinking this just kind of basically what's essentially just distilled water with not really any mineral content mm. and then wondering why it's not making them why they're still thirsty and a lot of it will come down to that you know if you've not if you're just having kind of plain what's called like bottled drinking water it's just not going to hydrate you as effectively as like a mineral water or like you say water with a, a meal that's got some minerals in it mm. so yeah. another layer 
Yeah, exactly. It's kind of interesting because um, I remember I was studying MNU and this was always interesting is like why was chocolate milk such a good drink post training for people? Uh, and milk is actually one of the most hydrating fluids you can drink because it has a massive balance of all the things you need, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Orange juice is not a bad shirt as well. So you can handle obviously the. And beer. Uh, and I, yeah, and beer as well. People think beer is dehydrating. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I can't remember what study it was where it was like kind of a bad one to bring up. But yeah, like beer was like as hydrating or more hydrating than like a sports drink is like oh great <laughs> don't tell that to people i think the poison is in the dose of that though to be fair as well yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so i thought that would uh, we'll probably run that out there so um yeah i thought that was quite a, a good a, a few very good uh potential areas to look at outside of just tracking calories and macros have you anything you want to add to finish off charlie um no i think we covered everything there but i think it's good a good mix of things people can do if they're completely green or if they want to move away from a very rigid sit setup they can implement some of these things and just take it away and run with it hopefully definitely 100 percent. so for everyone listening first thing i'll ask for you is is there anything you feel we missed are there any habits that you've changed that you feel i made that change and it was mm-hmm. it had a profound difference on me as an individual, my health and my, you know, my body composition goals. If there's anything we've missed, drop it in there. If you're watching this on YouTube, drop it in the comments. Or when you, uh, you, know, when you listen to the episode, shoot the direct message. We're always very, very happy to get feedback. Um, second point would be topics of the podcast. If there's anything you want us to chat on related to body composition, nutrition, training, also shoot the direct message as well. We'd love to hear from you. Last but not least, just support the podcast. We're going to be doing a lot more of these episodes and we're going to flip-flop back and forth between Charlie coming on the podcast, Mal coming on the podcast, maybe all three of us will be on at some point as well if we've got time. Um, so the best way you can support us is if you listen to the episodes, take a screenshot, pop it in your Instagram stories and tag us in at Better Body Collective, hashtag Better Body Radio. Um, and last but not least is if you're on Apple Podcast and you're listening to that, that's the one place we can leave reviews. So if you could leave us a five-star review, uh, that would also be massive because it means we can get this information in front of more people. Other than that, thanks very much again, Charlie. Got it, mate. All right, guys, over and out.